Okay, well, good morning, everybody. Let's uh, go ahead and take your Bibles and open up to Ephesians chapter 1. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 1. And let's, uh, let's start with questions, right? Always a good thing to do. Um, what do we think about when we think about the book of Ephesians? Who, who do we have as the author of the letter of Ephesians? Apostle Paul. Apostle Paul. <clears throat> good. And what are some of the things that you think about? I know we've only been two weeks into the study. We've done an introduction, so we're going to kind of get into uh, a couple verses here in the, in the salutation and the greeting here this morning. Uh, but what are some of the things that maybe you can recall from your notes or just from your own study time uh, or maybe even some questions you might have in your own study time the last couple weeks um, looking at it that you might have for, for comments or discussion here this morning? Anything else about uh, Ephesus or Ephesians, about the city itself, about the context, about what's happening, the listeners? What do you guys think about? What do we, what do we know about this? It's a large city, also the capital of Rome. Okay, yeah, it's a Roman capital in that, in that district. Um, Ephesus was in Asia uh, at that time, and so uh, it was a big city, a city of commerce. Um, good. They, remember, uh, worshipped a false goddess, right? Anybody remember the name of that goddess? It's okay. Diana. Yeah, yeah, Diana or Artemis, same, same one. Um, so... We went through and, remember, recapped some of Paul's journeys. And, and so for the first couple of weeks, we really laid out, I tried to lay out a case about Paul. Uh, as we know, he's the author and, and that he's the author of, uh, you know, at least 13 letters in the New Testament. And God used him greatly. Uh, but remember, he suffered greatly uh, for, for Christ's sake. And so maybe that brings something else into mind about the letter of Ephesus. Where is Paul at the time that he's, you know, dictating this letter, writing this letter? Good. He's in house arrest, right? He's in prison. And so he is <clears throat> in Rome now. And he is in prison. Uh, I said it is a type of house arrest situation. So it would have been that he was in a house. You can see in the end of Acts that he could rent on his own and stay on his own. However, uh, he was chained to Roman guards all the time during this time. Uh, but he had the leeway to, to have visitors and have people come in and to uh, host people and show hospitality and, and do those types of things. And, and so as I think of Paul, this is the picture and this is a scene. Think of maybe the busiest person or the busy, a busy body, right? Uh, I think of Jill, actually, who's, who's downstairs this morning, so I, I can use her. But uh, she is uh, just always on the go. Go, 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 always busy, always doing something, you know, very motivated, very driven. And... Uh, to take someone with that type of personality and to sit them somewhere and to say, you have to sit here and stay here for two years, that's, that's going to be a very difficult thing. It's been difficult. I've heard from people who uh, have been sick recently, you know, and they've been laid up in their house for 10 days or two weeks and, and just how it's driving them crazy, right? They just can't take it and they're getting depressed and they're getting anxious. And, and so as you think of Paul, what do we know about him? What was Paul doing before he finds himself here in Rome? traveling all over the place, right, for essentially 10 years, traveling all over uh, Macedonia and Asia and Greece and, and to Jerusalem and Syrian Antioch and all those places, if you remember on the map, uh, you know, just doing the work of the Lord, the work of evangelists, the work really of a missionary, right, and being out there constantly. And so uh, that's just coming to my mind about thinking about how, you know, this would be difficult for Paul, uh, but yet he knows it's God's will, and he knew he wanted to go to Rome. He didn't know probably that uh, at least we don't see in the scriptures that he knew he'd be going this way, right, in chains and in bondage. Uh, so imagine those Roman guards that were chained to Paul 24-7. You talk about witnessing opportunities, right? You know those guys who <laughs> are hearing about the Lord uh, all the time. And so that's kind of some of the context that set the stage. You know, we're talking about 61-62 AD that he is writing this letter and dictating this letter uh, out of this house arrest imprisonment situation in Rome. And, uh, and so he's sending this letter back to the church, and that's where we begin here now uh, in verse 1. And uh, let's go ahead and read, and we'll probably, we're probably really just going to get through the first two verses here today. And then the next verses are going to be uh, some pretty lengthy discussion and things that, that, uh, that we'll probably get into starting next week, Lord willing. So verse 1, uh, letter of Paul to the Ephesians. 
Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are at Ephesus, and who are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for these verses. Thank you so much for this text. Thank you so much for the context. Thank you that it is still applicable to us uh, some 2,000 years later. Uh, Lord, just how your word is a living thing and and it is active and sharper than any two-edged sword that it uh, totally um, takes and, and implements and, and inputs and imputes uh, your word into us that saves us. And so, God, we know that that is by faith. And so we are grateful for uh, that gift of salvation, the gift of repentance, the gift of faith in Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that we pray this morning. Jesus, yeah, Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Excuse me. Okay, so first two verses. Um, Paul, it says, an apostle of Christ Jesus. So in these first couple verses, we have what's pretty typical in Paul's letters, as most letters of the New Testament, uh, what we call a salutation, right, or a greeting. And it does say, again here, to the church or to the saints. And so let's kind of define that word. What does that mean when we say saints? Because, you know, if we have people in different denominations or from different religions, they would say saints might mean something differently than we do. Uh, I think about the Catholic Church, uh, which some of us are familiar with as we grew up in Catholic Church or maybe even recently, you know, have come out of the Catholic Church. Uh, what, do, what does the Catholic Church teach about the saints or what do they think about saints? Anybody know? That the apostles were saints. Mm -hmm, sure. So, yeah, some of the apostles definitely were saints, you know. Uh, well, let me just speak their view first. Yep, they would say that some of the apostles were saints. They would say other people are saints too, but um, those, somebody else maybe. Yeah. Those deemed as such by the church hierarchy. Mm -hmm. Okay. This context is. to say he is officially now a saint. What, does the, what do we believe the Bible teaches? What do you guys think the Bible says about the saints? Is that who Paul is addressing here? Just these upper echelon superhero believers, and that's who he's speaking of? Or what do you guys think this word saints mean? All believers. Okay, all believers, all followers of Jesus. And yeah, I would agree. I would say that when we see the word saints... In, in the New Testament, you know, and in the scriptures, it's speaking synonymously, right, with the church, with believers. Um, you know, the elect, as we'll see, uh, you know, Paul also calls them here in, in Ephesians 1. And so, uh, yeah, the saints, the believers, the church, the elect, uh, you know, those who have been granted this gift of repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. So it doesn't matter whether you're the thief on the cross and you are saved for just a short time before your death, or if you were Paul himself or any other of, of those kind of superhero Christians that we have in our minds, uh, they're all saints, right? Remember, there's only, there's only two categories, right? We have the saints and the ain'ts. You have the saved and the unsaved, and that's, that's, that's it. And so, uh, good. So it's two believers as he uh, gets into this. And he states here now in verse 1 uh, that he is an apostle of Jesus Christ. So now that we've defined saints... Let's kind of unpack this word here, and so present it in question form, as I'm certainly working on uh, in, in my teaching, and, and uh, you know, not so much in sermons, as that's more of a monologue uh, teaching, but, uh, you know, in, in our teaching, we want to certainly uh, inspire dialogue and, and try to have conversation, and so always trying to get better at that. So what is an apostle? And... Uh, a couple follow-up questions. How does that differ from a disciple? Is there a difference between an apostle and a disciple? Uh, and then another follow-up to think about that we'll get to after that is, are there apostles today? And so what do you, what do you guys think? Anybody have uh, insight on what is an apostle or what is a disciple? You guys don't like the Stanleys hog up everything? Come on, kids. I know y'all know, too. 
<laughs> hey, that's all right. We can't have it be quiet for too long. What do you guys think? Anybody know? Uh, what is an apostle or a disciple? How about we start with, what's a disciple? Okay, follower of Jesus. Uh, all of you that are going to school are disciples, right? So, so what am I saying by that word? What does the word disciple mean? When you guys think of disciples, who do you think of? Typically. The 12, the 12 disciples, right? Um, so a disciple is a student. Because did only Jesus have disciples? I see Sky shaking his head no. Okay, so why do you say no, brother? Well, I recant what I said first, like, like, disciples, like, a student. Well, it says right there, but it's a student, it's someone being taught, is it being taught scriptures? Mm -hmm. Or anything? Yeah, it could be certainly applicable, you know, in a general sense. But yeah, in our sense, context, we're talking about, yeah, certainly teaching of the scriptures. So if you think about... Um, you know, kind of the apprentice um, relationship, right, with a master and apprentice, as I think a Matt, you know, has, has been an apprentice electrician, and he has a master over him, teaching him. Um, and so, yeah, disciple wasn't a word that just was, oh, these are Jesus' 12, and that's who disciples are. Uh, disciples, look, John the Baptist had disciples. Remember a couple weeks ago when we did the introduction, I took you back to show you Paul, uh, how he was instrumental in Ephesus, and when he came, it said that he talked to 12 disciples of John, of John the Baptist, and asked them about, you know, have you been baptized with the Holy Spirit and that, that whole thing. And so uh, who would be the primary masters or teachers in the Old Testament of the law and of the Bible? The Pharisees, the Sadducees, right? And so they all had disciples, and they selected their disciples. So their disciples would go to school, they would be taught, I think of Paul, uh, here's some advanced Jedi points. Anybody know uh, who was Paul's master? Paul was a disciple and a Pharisee, and he was taught by who? Anyone know that or recall that? Start with a G. Mm -hmm. It's uh, not Gary. Not Gary. <laughs> At least like four or five syllables. Yeah. Tell us. G-A-M? Yeah. G A M and then there's some L's and I E's in there. Gam <laughs> Gamaliel. Gamaliel. Yeah, yeah. Gamaliel. Okay. Um, so he okay. was the Pharisee who taught uh, Paul, and so Pharisees and Sadducees had disciples. Uh, so when we think about Jesus having disciples, that means that Jesus is what? A master. He's a teacher. Uh, and you see that. Remember, uh, throughout the Gospels, you'll see people call him Rabbi, say to him Rabbi, or say to him Teacher. Uh, you know, and so that's what we're talking about. It's a student of a master is what a disciple is. So many had disciples, and there are many disciples. And to, to Sky's point, we are disciples, right, of Christ. We are students of Christ and of his word, okay? So we are disciples. Now, uh, apostle, let's talk about that a little bit to kind of distinguish a little bit of difference here. Here's the Greek word, apostolos. Okay, and it's translated, as you can see there, 81 times in your New Testament, this word apostolos. 78 of those times, it's uh, translated as apostle. Two times as messenger, and one time as he that is sent. And right in that, that gives you the definition of what apostolos is. Okay, an apostle is one who is sent. One who is sent out. Uh, it's a messenger. It's a delegate. Uh, I think of Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, where he's, or chapter 5, excuse me, where he says, uh, you know, we have this ministry of reconciliation. And what does he call us? He says, we are ambassadors for Christ. Uh, apostle is a delegate, an ambassador, uh, a messenger who is sent out by their master, by someone. Uh, it's kind of like a herald. If you think of back in the day, the king would send a herald, and, and a herald uh, would be one who goes to proclaim, right? You know that we're maybe familiar with the song, Hark the Herald Angel. That's an angel who is sent out to tell and to proclaim and broadcast a message from the master. So the king would send out a herald, and they would come out, maybe blow trumpets and yell and say, Hear ye, hear ye, right? 
and and you would say uh you know today in in this kingdom you know a son has been born to the king you know whatever the the proclamation is whatever the message is that's what the herald would give and so they're under the authority of the king apostle same type of thing it is a a delegate or messenger who's sent out uh with the power and the authority of the one who sends them that's key okay so uh matthew chapter 10 we're going to go there here shortly so let's go ahead and flip there uh go to matthew chapter 10 please in your bibles and in matthew chapter 10 we see jesus has been teaching the disciples for quite some time he is now sending them out on their own and and he is going to gift them and to equip them uh and so i use this and you're going to see right here in this text that in regards to the 12 the word disciple and the word apostle are used interchangeably okay so that's what i want you to see here let's look at the first five verses if somebody can uh, can grab that and read nice and loud for us, please. I know there's names in there, but it's not an Old Testament genealogy, so uh, so I don't feel bad by putting these ones on you. I think we can get through it. Uh, chapter 10 of Matthew 1 through 5. Who can get that for us nice and loud? Jesus summoned, <clears throat> Jesus summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits, cast them out, and heal every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Oh. Um, yeah, that's okay. <laughs> got page six. <laughs> <laughs> we got I had that happen to me earlier this Now the names of the twelve apostles are these. The first, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, and James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. One Continue more verse. On. Yeah, one more verse. Thank you. Okay. These twelve Jesus sent out after instructing them, do not go in the way of the Gentiles, and do not enter any city of the Samaritans. Thank you. Okay, I actually didn't read that verse, but that's okay. So look in those verses. Look at verse 1. It says, Jesus summoned his 12 what? Disciples. Look at verse 2. Now the names of the 12 what? Apostles. Okay, so we do see these words used interchangeably. However, uh, I will say that we see them used interchangeably with the 12. Okay. Um, that they are disciples because they're students. Now, in this uh, chapter, he is equipping them. Do you see what it says? He gave them authority over clean spirits to cast out demons, to heal every kind of sickness, okay? So they now have the power of the Spirit to go do what? Miracles, right? Jesus has given them the power to do this, sends them out to do it, and so now they, are, they, have, come, they have gone from disciples to being what? apostles they're now sent out with the power and the authority from the one who is the sender right capital s um in, in jesus and so that we see these words used interchangeably now i do want to clarify something um actually we'll probably get to that in a moment uh let's talk a little bit more about this word apostolos okay the word apostle we actually see it used in two different manners in the new testament we see it referring to specifically uh an office okay of the 12 here that we see of jesus of these 12 apostles of jesus and we also see it referring to other disciples in a general sense of the word okay so let me uh get to a couple of these so that we can see the scriptures teach us this that this isn't something that uh you know i'm coming out of left field that i believe and that others uh don't believe because we know in the church today there are many who call themselves apostles Okay, and, and so we want to understand this, and, and are there apostles today, or are there not, and what is the difference? So let's look at the apostle in the sense of the twelve. Um, so let's go back to where we were in Ephesians. And to chapter 2. And look at verse 19 and 20. Paul, as we get to chapter 2, you will see Paul is going to be speaking to 
uh, those who are dead in their trespasses and sins, right? They were unbelievers, and now they've come to being believers, okay? And so um, that you were, that's the context. So you were outside of Christ, but now you are in Christ. And now look at verse 19. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, right, from God, but you are fellow citizens with the saints. There's the word again, right, with all the saints, not just with a couple of the higher ones. And are of God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. So he's speaking here the foundations of the apostles. Who are the apostles of the foundation? The twelve apostles of Christ. And it says, and the prophets. Flip to uh, Revelation, please. Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21. Whoever gets there first, if you will read verse 14, please. Revelation 21, 14. We should have done a sword the, drill. The wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Okay. So the wall of the city, this is the new heaven and new earth. Remember we came out of eschatology several months ago? But this is the new heaven and new earth, and that spiritual city that we will all be in. It says the wall of the city had how many foundations? 12. And the names on each of them had the names of who? The apostles of, of the Lamb. Who is the Lamb of Revelation? Jesus. Jesus Christ. So he had how many then apostles? 12, therefore. Uh, so there weren't more than 12 apostles. It says these 12 apostles of Christ are the ones who uh, the foundation of the church is built on. And so just in that premise, I would say to you, we are some 2,000 years in from the death of Christ and from the foundation and the building of, of, the, of the New Testament church. Are we still building the foundation right now? We're not. The foundation's been laid. The cornerstone is Christ. The foundation's been laid by the prophets and by the apostles. Then Peter, remember, speaks about how we as believers are all living stones being placed on this foundation and building this living city, this church of Christ. So that foundation is down here, and it's solid, right? Because the cornerstone is solid on Christ. Foundation, solid, and now we're being built up for the last 2,000 years on the foundation of the rock of the cornerstone of Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Would the uh, foundation, and the, you know, the 12 apostles described, would that exclude Judas Iscariot, but include the one who was appointed thereafter? Great question. Great question. Who is the one that was appointed thereafter? What? Yeah, I heard it. Go ahead. Did you say it? Well, the one who took the place of Judas. Yeah. Matthias. 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 Yes. So we find that in Acts, right? When we go through Acts chapter 1 and 2, we see what you're referring to. Uh, Judas Iscariot is not one of the 12 apostles because why? He betrayed him. He betrayed him and showed that he was what? He was not, an, he was not a disciple. He, he was not an apostle. He's not a, he's not a saint. He's in hell, according to Jesus himself, the word himself, right? He says... Uh, the Son of Man is going to go as it's to be, but woe to the one who betrayed the Son of Man. It would have been better for him to never been born. So that tells you where Judas is, okay? So with that being said, the apostles cast lots between Matthias and I think uh, Justice, I believe, Brian, uh, was the other one. So there were two they were deciding on. They cast lots, the lot fell on Matthias. They selected him to replace Judas. It appears... Uh, we can talk about this more later, but it appears to me that the Lord chose who to be the replacement to be the 12th apostle? Paul, who is our writer here. Uh, as he knocked him off his horse with the visit, he chose him on uh, by the Lord himself, chose him and equipped him to be an apostle. Uh, and so I believe that Paul is one of the 12 apostles um, of Christ. And so that's a great question, and that's where I would would fall on that and lean on that to say uh, Matthias yes was a disciple of Christ uh, and and an apostle in a general sense which we'll get to next but not of the 12 apostles because certainly Paul is one of the 12 apostles okay. so let's look at the other sense of this word the general uh, sense of this word of apostle it speaks of this about others so turn please to Acts chapter 13 <coughs> Excuse me. I'm in 
Matthew. I'm turning the wrong way. Acts chapter 13. And actually, let me do this for the sake of time. If um, Let me go around the horn. Craig and Tori, would you please get Romans 16, 7? Uh, let's go to you guys, maybe uh, Caitlin and Lizzie. Would you guys get 2 Corinthians 8, 23? And then uh, Matt, if you will get Philippians 2, 25. So Acts 13, 2 says this. While they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them. Okay? Um, so this ministering uh, is, is translated here and used as the same word that we're talking about uh, in apostolos. So it's referring to Barnabas here. And actually, look over at chapter 14 of Acts. Verse 4 says, But the people of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews and some with the apostles, plural. And in the context, it's referring to Paul and Barnabas. So we see Barnabas called an apostle in the scriptures. Uh, who had Romans 16, 7? Tori, would you read that nice and loud for us, please? Thank you. Sorry, I'm hard of hearing up here. Um, so, Adronicus and Junius, it just said they are apostles. Okay, you see it there? A um, couple more. 2 Corinthians 8, 23. KK, can you read that nice and loud, please? Sorry, I still can't hear. Did that one say messenger, like fellow messenger? Is that what you said? And that word messenger is one of the times that I talked about before, is the word ap apostolos. So it's saying Titus is also an apostle. Uh, Philippians 2.25, I think Matt had that, right? Yep. I have thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, and your messenger and minister to my name. Thank you. That word messenger is apostolos. So... Uh, it's calling one, two, three, four, five men here that I've got for examples, apostles. So, in a sense, all believers are apostles. All believers are disciples. Because, aren't we all called to be ambassadors for Christ? Aren't we all called to be witnesses for Christ and to be messengers of Christ? We are. But yet, there's still a distinguishing office of apostle of Jesus Christ, meaning he appointed those 12 for a specific time, for a specific office, and for his specific purpose. So let's talk about that, because I know that might be, uh, you know, a little bit to chew on here. So thoughts, comments, questions, and before you leave, Brian, maybe you have input uh, that might clarify that? No? Nope. So does that make sense? Can we wrap our brain around that? What do, you, what do you guys think? And I would point to um, the fact of Ephesians 2 again to say that we are no longer laying the foundation. The foundation of the church was laid by Christ, certainly, uh, but by the 12 apostles. And, uh, and that he equipped them in great ways to do a specific uh, ministry at a specific time. What was happening in the time of those 12? Why would it have been important for them to have uh, special gifts and, and abilities to do miracles and those types of things? Why would that be the case, you think? Persecution and unbelief in Jesus. Okay. Good. And it's the beginning, right? It's the beginning of this New Testament church thing. Jesus is the one. He came proclaiming and preaching the gospel. He laid down his life to uh, purchase, if you will, the gospel. And now he's passing the baton, if you will, to the apostles and saying, you now have the authority, you're now going to take it into this next stage of structure, of, of appointing leaders, right? What did the apostles do? They took the baton and they passed it off to who? Which is who? Who are the leaders of the churches? The elders, the pastors. You see it? 
the apostles took the baton. Did the 12 apostles die? They all died. They passed the baton, as Paul said, go and appoint elders in every church in all the churches in all the cities. Why? Because those are the ones who are now going to take this mantle of proclaiming the truth and teaching the word of God and being accountable for that, right? As James 3, 1 says, let not many of you be teachers because there's a higher judgment accountability. That's who are the baton takers now. It's the, it's the preachers, it's the pastors, it's the elders, God bless you. Uh, it's no longer the apostles. And so just to answer the question I put out there to you, uh, I don't believe that there are apostles anymore today. When you hear people say that, and, and I'll, I'll take you to some, another place here to, to show you why as well, uh, that this was for a specific time to grow the church. Think of Moses. What was the purpose, do you guys think? Why was Moses able to part the Red Sea? We could say, okay, to escape from the Egyptians. But why was Moses able to do those plagues and cause those miracles to happen? Why did God do that? Why did he empower Moses and Aaron to be able to do those miraculous signs and wonders? To testify, to change people. To testify, for sure. To say, the one who's speaking, the messenger, the ambassador, the lowercase a apostle, if you want to say, is represented a representative of the master so the one who's giving the signs and the miracles and doing all the wonders people are looking in awe at that person right and if you look at the new testament look in acts it's not hard to find early on you'll see uh peter and john go to the temple and there's a man who's been crippled his whole life and they he asks for some alms and monies and they say we have nothing to give you but what we do have we give to you in the name of Jesus Christ. And he grabs his by the hand and says, rise and, and stand and walk. And this man is healed, and everybody is in awe and wonder, of course, because he just did a miracle. And what is Peter's response? He immediately says, don't look at me as if I'm powerful enough to do this. This had nothing to do with me. This had to do with God who raised him, and this God is the God who I proclaim, who is Jesus Christ, who just died, and he gives us a sermon. And 3,000 people are saved at the, in that day. So the signs and the wonders are to validate the messenger. See it? That I'm a messenger of God, and the reason you know that is because of the signs and the wonders. Now that ceased. We, we, I don't have those signs and wonders. I'm not able to do that to prove to you because I don't need to prove to you. Christ has built his church how he has, and what do we have as evidence, as witness? We have the word of God. And we preach and we proclaim and we tell others the word of God because we know that hearing comes by faith from hearing the word of God, Romans 10, 17. And so that was for a specific time uh, and a specific age of the church in order for the, the Lord to do what? Who is the one building the church? Christ, right? I will build my church, he says to Peter. Uh, the Christ is being built by, by, excuse me, the church is being built by Christ and he has seen fit to do it in different times throughout different ages. Uh, flip, please. We'll close with 2 Corinthians 12. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 12. So you can see, you're probably, when I started off, you're probably thinking, we're only going to get through two verses today. Really, what did we get through? Three words, I think. So um, 2 Corinthians 12. But you understand sometimes it's significant. It's important, right? I, I, we don't intentionally say, like, yep, yeah, I'm going to preach on three words today. Do you see how big of a discussion this is and how it's applicable and why it's important? to understand what an apostle is. So when you go to a church and you hear them say, Apostle Guillermo is going to be giving you a word of wisdom today and understand they are, are teaching something totally different than what we teach and what we believe the Bible says. Yes, sir. Oh, if, if I get this right, though, if they were to say that, wouldn't they not be wrong in the way that, you, like you said, we're all called to go out and to be messengers of the word? Yes. So call someone an apostle may or may not be incorrect so yes i understand the premise of your question and comment and i would say the problem is we don't see other than like those four places i showed you we don't see the word apostle given to others other than a couple of those men who were side by side with the apostles um, so yes in a sense we all are ambassadors we all are lowercase apostles but we don't call ourselves apostles because why it's confusing. I'm not an apostle of the 12 of Jesus Christ. So when we refer to apostles, we're referring to who? The 12. 
So we don't use that as a broad terminology. We might use disciple uh, or messenger or other word, but we don't generally use apostle, and that's why. Because we don't want confusion of lower a, lowercase a and big A, if you will, apostle, uh, and who God used to lay the foundation through those 12. Because we saw in the scriptures, right, that how many of those were laying the foundations? How many apostles did Jesus Christ have? 12. The scriptures tell us that. Um, so yes, in the broad sense, you're right, and that's why I bring it to our attention. But we don't use that, and those churches don't use it in that sense. They're saying it to say that is an apostle who is gifted with the gifts that apostles get, and that's why you should listen to what they say, because what they say is just as important as this word of God in the Bible. So it's it's heretical, and that's why it's hugely different. So look at Second Corinthians 12, and it might help us, I think, Sky. Second uh, Corinthians 12, 12 says... The signs of a true apostle were performed among you with all perseverance by signs and wonders and miracles. So, answer, to answer the question, are we still laying the foundations of the church today? No. The apostles already did that. Are the, are the apostles, are there people today gifted with, what does it say here? are the signs of an apostle. What, what do they have and what are they able to do? Healing. Healings, miracles, and wonders. If somebody's claiming to be an apostle, ask them to show you the gifts. Ask them to show you the miracles. And they will claim to have those. And that's why they'll bump people on the head and say you're healed. Like That's just the charismatic Pentecostal. It's a, a whole different movement of the church that we don't recognize with because we believe the scriptures don't teach that. Does that make sense? So uh, it's closing time, so we're going to stop there. we got two minutes of uh, comments, questions, thoughts, more. Yeah, go ahead, brother. Um, other than going through the, the scriptures that you gave us to go look at, it doesn't, there is no uppercase apostle in the Bible, right? Like, they don't uppercase it at all. It's just... Oh, you mean like in the actual yeah. Bible? No, no. I was just saying that. Sorry. Good for clarification. When I said that, I was just trying to distinguish between, say, a lower case A apostle would be like the messenger in broad sense, like those other men, and the capital A would be referring to the 12th. I was just saying that so we know what we're talking about. But no, there's no capital A there. Um, if you have a NASB, every capital that's referring to deity of Christ will have a capital. And I love that about the NASB. So you know every pronoun that's he. If it's about Christ, it's capital. If it's Redeemer, capital R. That's talking about Jesus. Uh, and so, and I write like that. You'll see it in my notes even. Like, I just always do that. If you're talking about the Lord, uh, he's my Savior and Redeemer, capital S, capital R. You know what I mean? Like, that's who I'm talking about. I'm talking about the capital of all things. Um, so, yeah, in, in that sense, we just mean the 12. And uh, uh, I can actually just yeah, look at... King James, it's only like, with like, Lord, right? And God. Uh, oh, yeah, it's certainly right for, for deity of God. Yeah, and, and you may have all capital all caps for Lord, remember, which means Yahweh or Jehovah, uh, which we've looked at a lot in the, in the Old Testament and Genesis. I do want to read just Acts 2.43, just to give you uh, an example as I've got that there. Um, Acts 2.43 is talking about the church. Verse 42 says, they were continually devoting themselves, meaning the church, these believers, to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. See it? He was using that to build the church and grow the church, to believe in the truth of the gospel. And so through that time that we call progressive revelation, a lot of those signs and miracles and things cease. Now, when I say that, I don't want somebody to just label me as a cessationalist and all these things don't happen and God doesn't have the power. I thoroughly believe if God wants to heal someone from cancer or someone that can't walk, he wants to give them the ability to walk, and he wants to use a believer uh, to, say, lay hands on them and pray, and that, and that God miraculously heals them. Could that happen? Certainly that can happen. God is God. He raises people from the dead. That's what he does. But what I am saying is I don't see that gift today. I don't see that gift anywhere today. Where in the apostles' sense, in, the first, in their case, in the first century, it was Peter was healing everyone he touched so that they were bringing all the sick people out to the, to the streets just to see his shadow go by, thinking that they'd be healed. That's different. 
If I have the gift of healing, I can heal you all of anything you have. I don't see men have that gift anymore. And so I'm not putting it, God in a box to say he can't do that. He can heal. He, he can make a paralyzed person for 30 years walk anytime he wants to. He, he can bring the dead person that's been dead for 30 years alive anytime he wants to. Right? So we believe in God and that he's big and he's sovereign. But we believe he's now working in a different way than he was then. Okay. How about, how about the epistles? Are those only letters from the apostles? Uh, so that's a great question. Um, that and that would be one of the prerequisites in, in having, you know, the canon of the scriptures would be to say that the writings in the New Testament were written by apostles. And so that's why many would attribute this letter of Hebrews to Paul, because he is an apostle. Uh, or to, I would attribute it to Luke, uh, but we can still talk about that too, because not all of them are. Uh, Luke is not, you know, Luke's not one of the twelve. Uh, John Mark is not one of the twelve uh, who wrote the Gospel of Mark. Um, so it didn't have to be that they had to be one of the twelve, but they definitely had to be in, in the circle, right? Uh, we see John Mark and we see Luke um, certainly as writers in the New Testament. Uh, we see uh, James that, and Jude, two of the half-brothers of Jesus Christ, as writers of the New Testament. They are not apostles. Some would say that James is an apostle. He was a leader in the church of, of Jerusalem. He's not one of the 12 apostles, I don't believe, because he's not listed in the 12. The word epistle is just a Greek letter. Hebrew name for letter. Yeah, just means letter. Word. So it's just letter. Word. Yeah, so when it says epistle from an apostle, yeah. it just means a letter from an apostle. Okay. Yeah, good. All right, we got to pray. Thank you, guys. If you've got more, please write it down in your notes. Look it up through the week. Let, let's write some questions. You can always call me, email me, text me. We can talk about it next week. Um, yeah, keep, keep up the fight. Keep studying. Uh, keep taking your notes and looking over good stuff. Uh, Matt, would you close for us, brother? Thank you. Lord, thank you again for this morning. We just thank you for, for your word. And as we continue to go through it and learn just learn more about it, Lord, I pray that you just help us to, uh, to continue to grow in our confidence in your word, grow uh, our confidence in our salvation and hope. So in eternity with you in heaven, Lord, and just uh, thank you so much for the encouragement we received uh, from your word. I thank you for this ministry and for the encouragement we received from church and from teaching, and I pray that you just help us to uh, just, just have a great morning, the uh, rest of the morning, as Pastor Craig brings your word again, um, and I pray that uh, you just speak to each one of us and treat our hearts with your word this morning. Just your Amen. Amen. 30 more seconds before you pull your chairs out to say, I'm realizing, you know, maybe we didn't focus a lot, it's a lot of learning, right, Sunday school is a lot of teaching, a lot of learning, uh, but certainly we always want to get application, so as we talk about lowercase a, right, apostle, but we're disciples of Christ, right, so as Paul instructs us, we're ambassadors for Christ, and, and you know, the Great Commission, Jesus says, go out and pro proclaim the gospel, go, go and teach, and, and baptize, and make disciples, right, of the nations, and so uh, that's, that's our application, that's where we need to be all the time, right, and that can always be applicable to us, but as we think of apostles, and who God uses, and his disciples, uh, his messengers, his delegates, we are those, and so we need to go and share the truth with the world around us so that they may be saved. Praise the Lord. Thank you, everybody.